Okay, I think that's going. So with that, I think we'll get started. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thanks again, uh, Debbie, for, for joining us and everyone who's on opposite hours uh, for watching this recording when you get a chance. Uh, my name is Jordan Menzel. I've already spoken or met with many of you, and I'm the expedition director here at Choice, and we'll do uh, a few more introductions in just a minute. But for those that we do have uh, calling in right now, uh, we definitely want to take some time to do some introductions there. And with that, maybe we'll start with a few of the people who I know can't be here, but I'll introduce them on behalf, uh, just for a little context that I, that I for sure know aren't going to be able to join us. Uh, we have a few great families, uh, one of which I've had the opportunity to already go on an expedition with just very recently, who are based in London. Uh, the first family is the Stevensons. They're a family of six, uh, teenagers all the way down to nine years old. Fantastic family. We traveled with them on an expedition to Guatemala just barely over Christmas. And so they already know the drill for how expeditions work. And having traveled with them and their kids, I know everyone that's going on this trip is in for a real treat. They're a very fun family and a very competitive speed card game playing family. Uh, in fact, Chris Stevenson won our, our tournament, I think it was Christmas Eve. And so if anyone feels like they can take him on, I encourage them to do so on this trip. And then they're going to be joining us with uh, some dear friends of theirs who I haven't had the opportunity to travel with, but I've heard also great things about the Ashtons, also based in London, another family uh, with some great kids who are well-traveled. And so they're not able to join us on this call, but they will be on the trip. And so I just wanted to make a note uh, of them. And then we've got a few more who might be joining us who are based uh, from all over, also here in Salt Lake City, um, who, who might be able to join us today. And so with that, maybe I'll hand it over to you, Debbie, to introduce yourself and Brooks, uh, for those who might watch this afterwards and who are here. Okay, here comes my son. <laughs> Hi, I'm Debbie Nyson. Um, this is my son, Brooks Nyson. Hi. He is... <laughs> He's in 10th um, grade, he'll be 16 in April. And we live in Sandy, Utah. And this is our first expedition, we're very excited. Uh, Debbie or Brooks, have either of you traveled outside of uh, kind of the US to what would be considered kind of a developing country, maybe off the beaten path for, for a normal vacation? No, mm -hmm. I've, I've been to some, to Mexico a little bit, but nothing. We have not been to Asia. We haven't been to a third world country. Okay. And Brooks, I take it your answer is about the same. <laughs> well, good. We're, we're excited to have you both join us. Um, and this is quite a first trip to be taking. So I, I commend you for jumping right in there. Um, I'll maybe jump right ahead here to let Veronica introduce herself. I already mentioned I'm the director of expeditions, and so I've had a chance to work a lot with you. I won't be on this trip, unfortunately. I wish I could be, but uh, I won't be there, but you've got a fantastic group of leaders who will be taking you, and so I'll let Ver Veronica introduce herself, and then I'll just uh, introduce one of your other leaders, Keith, who isn't able to be here tonight. Great. Thanks, Jordan. Um, hi, I'm Veronica Schindler. I'm really excited to be taking this trip with you and serving this capacity. I've been affiliated with Choice as an expedition leader for about six years now and just love this opportunity. Um, I have a background in development communications. I was at Stanford for a number of years, just uh, recently uh, finished working there and I'm now based in Southern California. So really excited to help you prepare for what will be an incredible experience. I've been to Nepal about six times now. It's very close to my heart. I love the people, the culture, and really excited to, uh, to get to take this journey with you. And one thing I'll say about how lucky you all are to travel with Veronica is, as she mentioned, she's been leading expeditions for years and had been to Nepal extensively. Um, she'll also be based out in Nepal for a few months uh, in order to accommodate kind of leading a number of expeditions that Choice has both this expedition and a handful others with a few corporate partners. And Choice thought very long and hard about the right type of personality, also the right type of leader that we wanted to base out in Nepal, and that our in-country teams 
also wanted to work with out in Nepal. And Veronica's name, when I recently had joined Choice, uh, was the name that just kept popping up from everyone uh, in multiple different parts as a great recommendation. And so I can attest that you're all uh, in great, great hands. And Veronica, as I mentioned, will be based out there uh, about a month beforehand and also for a few months after. And so just an amazing resource for everybody as, uh, as you guys head out there. And I'll take a minute now to introduce uh, Keith Ellis, uh, who is also going to be one of your expedition leaders. Uh, and you're equally as lucky to be going with Keith. Hey, we've got some visitors here. Hey, come on over. Isn't it the meeting? It is. And we've got a lot of people who are calling in internationally. So here's what wow. I'm going to do. I'm going to turn this so back we're, up. We're the only people. Yeah, so <laughs> that you probably okay. feel. Here. No, we're good. we'll pull this up. Actually, you know what? We're probably good without this, to be so honest. I'm sorry. We got a little lost. Okay. No, well, we'll I was just introducing. Uh, so my name's Jordan. Welcome. Hi, Jordan. Cammie. Cammie. David. Pleasure Taylor. to meet you. Okay. Davis is the one going. Okay. And remind me of your last name, David? Taylor. Taylor. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, this is great. Welcome, welcome. And are you going with... Can my sister call in right now? Yes. Yeah, we can. There is call-in information. Um, Do you... I don't think she has it because her son's going. She was just... Are you guys going with Sherry? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, so there's Hi. Debbie on the line who's one of Sherry's dear friends. Oh, hello, Debbie. Hi, Cammy. Why are you here? <laughs> well, we found out we could do it this way, and Brooks had a ton of homework, so we did it this way. Hi, Davis. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. Uh, you're going to pay for that. Yeah. And I said, I said it's going to be in Brooks, you know, because now he's got to actually get the homework done. So I think yeah. <laughs> uh, it's him. Well, okay, awesome. Cool. No, we're good. So Do you Jeff have... can call in right now. Um, what's the number? Uh, let's see. I let me pull it up real quick. Veronica, do you have? I've got my screen share up here. Do you have by chance the email where you could pull the call in number? And for those for those of you who are gonna who are gonna watch this and watch. Uh, you can just fast forward for a minute. <laughs> we'll pick up in just a second. Sorry. No problem at all. We have uh, two large families who are based in London, so they'll be watching this on recording. Okay, I've got the number here, Jordan. Uh, we've got a dial in at 646-558-8656. Well, she, she could do the same thing we're doing on the computer, too. If you... I told her to call in right now, so we'll see no, what she says. Okay. And then is there a code or anything? Uh, uh, there's a meeting ID. Yep. Okay. And that's 537-394-362. Okay, what is it again? I'm it's, sorry. It's up there. The meeting ID? Oh, yeah. You say it, baby. I can't say it. 537. Uh-huh. 394-362. Need to call. Four. Okay. Okay. Well, good. Hopefully that works for them to call on in and no worries at all. She's like, can you send me meeting ID? Oh, nice. Okay, we're there. We'll see if someone has a chance to hop in. We'll probably see them right down here. Um, but yeah, so welcome. We've just been kicking off some introductions. So I'm Jordan. I run the Exodus program here at Choice. And then to summarize, uh, we've got Debbie and Brooks and Veronica, who's one of the expedition leaders for this trip. Uh, right now based out of Southern California. And then I was just introducing Keith Ellis, who is going to be the co-lead on this trip. And Keith has actually worked here at Choice for over 15 years on our field operations and commu team communications. And so from a perspective of someone who manages a lot of our programs, we've got a really unique set of leaders taking in that Veronica has spent extensive amount of time based in Nepal. And Keith has, uh, you know, is so much organizational and operational and project knowledge about the work that's been going on, not only in Nepal, but also broadly with choice. And so between the two uh, individuals, uh, you've got a really, really great group going. So with that, um, we'll just kind of get uh, straight into the conversation and maybe have real quick, 
if you guys can introduce yourselves and maybe just touch on Sherry and I know of, of kind of some other grandkids are going and kind of just quick introduction to, to who's going for those who might, you know, be hopping on this a little bit later. That would be you, David. All right. <laughs> so I'm Davis. Um, <laughs> where, where are you guys from? Uh, Salt Lake. Yeah, we're from Salt Lake. Okay, right in Salt Lake. So, um, yeah, and then my cousin's name is Hayden, and okay. my other cousin is Darwin. Okay, Darwin, Davis, and Hayden. Hayden. Yep. And my grandma, Sherry, is uh, the one taking us. All right. Okay, well, I, I think you guys are lucky group of grandkids. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and Sherry, yeah. Sherry is an ambitious she's, grandma. I love it. She's amazing. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I spoke with her, and I was a, very, very impressed with her enthusiasm. So we've got a really good group going. We've got a handful of other teenagers who are also coming. Uh, again, like I mentioned, uh, based in London. And some of them have been on expeditions before. I've traveled with some of them, actually. So I'm very, very jealous of the group that's going here. Um, so today we're just going to kind of have a conversation and walk through uh, some of the components of an expedition for those of you who are new to choice and maybe kind of curious what that expedition means and how it fits into choice. We're going to talk a little bit about that and then just go through logistics. So everyone's got a really good base so that they can ask the right questions moving forward uh, as you continue to prepare. And just a quick note on the in-country team. So Every expedition is supported by someone like myself on the kind of HQ side. Our expedition leaders who you've just briefly met, you'll meet more over the coming weeks, particularly when you're in country. But they're supported by an entire in-country team who is from Nepal, is based in Nepal, and is working year-round on rural community development. Even when expeditions have no part of kind of their, their work, that's what they specialize in. And so they're, uh, we're very lucky with our team in Nepal and that they're not only fantastic at the work that they do, but they're some of our, our teams that execute the, the most organized and kind of efficient and engaging expeditions as well. It's really a skill set that they build up because they've handled over the years many, many groups uh, and a lot of support to Nepal. So in particular, you'll spend a lot of time getting to know uh, Bishnu, he's the in-country director in Nepal. Uh, I was just here actually over the last few weeks for a couple in-country conferences and just an amazing guy. And so I just put these names and faces up there so that everyone can start to get a sense that the expedition is not just the leaders, but in fact a whole community uh, that you'll spend a lot of time working with and learning from. And also uh, if your expedition goes like most do in Nepal, Dancing with Vishnu is <laughs> quite the dancer when he gets the chance. <laughs> so great group. Uh, take the time to get to know them. Uh, they're just an amazing, amazing group of people. Uh, just a quick note on kind of how Choice operates and the model. So Choice is a nonprofit organization that has been around for over 30 years. And right now it operates in seven countries, but it was originally based out of Salt Lake City operating in the Altiplano of, of Bolivia. So founded due to uh, an international development economist, Dr. Mayfield, who was teaching at the University of Utah, along with a broad community here in Utah that had interest to start to support international development. So it started very small and very micro, kind of with one-off expeditions. Uh, going to the Altiplano, and very quickly they learned that uh, there was a model that would be much more effective if it included and was driven by local leaders in every country. And so that evolved over the years with some of those principles in mind that it was is community driven and and local and native in nature. And so what that's spread out to uh, now over the years, if everyone can kind of see is uh, Choice now operating in seven countries. So Nepal, where we're going, uh, very active. I don't know if that's... Uh, very active in Kenya, Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, Mexico, Guatemala, also some project work in Vietnam. And in each one of those countries, there is an in-country team that is uh, much like the team I just introduced from Nepal. And that team has a staff anywhere from five to 12 and year round they're working with communities and community leadership to help those communities build the resources and the skill sets 
to identify their own projects and priorities, to leverage their own resources through sweat equity or local funds or municipal funds, and then to match that with choice expertise, technology, and also funds to carry out community-led projects. So that, and as I'll kind of show right here, that's kind of the model of how choice functions. So they're working with communities to identify real commitment for change. Their income teams are, are training and team building communities. They're developing action plans and communities are actually managing the execution of their projects. And then where expeditions fit into is um, it's an infrequent opportunity for an expedition to come down, infuse some capital. So every participant who's going on an expedition should consider their expedition uh, a large part of it is a fundraiser. Um, that's accelerating a project budget that we will be supporting. Um, where typically expeditions are welcomed into a community to support a phase of a project, meaning that that community is running or managing that project long before we arrive with us in a much accelerated fashion and then long after we leave, which allows that project and that visit to be very sustainable. Uh, expeditions plug into part of a much bigger process uh, and participants get a real chance to learn what that is uh, in country because they'll start to they'll have a lot of great opportunities to uh, to learn how their visit fits into what Vishnu and his team are doing uh, well after expeditions leave. So you'll see at the top here there's a celebration and evaluation phase. That's really where expeditions fit in. It's a chance for communities to celebrate what they've done, to have an intercultural exchange with a whole other community, which is ours, who is visiting that they might not otherwise have. So it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity to work together, to learn from each other, and to really celebrate what they're carrying out, which is their own process to improve the options and decisions that they have to, uh, you know, to tackle some of the problems facing extreme poverty, which uh, exists in many forms, particularly in Nepal. So uh, it's an amazing opportunity, and we kind of consider expeditions uh, we, we treat them very seriously, that it's a, it's a rare opportunity to get invited into a community and, and, and going is a very unique opportunity to experience a community in a way, that, or a country even, that uh, the, the traditional path of a visit or a tourist would just never have the opportun opportunity to do so. Uh, so with that, because it's a non-traditional type of experience, I'm going to just minimize this for a minute. Hold on here. Um, because it's a, a non-traditional type of experience, uh, every expedition has a lot of factors that we can know, right, that are very common to any type of travel, which is we know that there's going to be an itinerary, and I can guarantee that the food is going to be quality, and we'll have clear parameters around a project, and everyone starting now should start to think about their, their intentions for going, even if they're invited, uh, maybe what some of their personal goals might be or things that they might want to learn or observe. And, and accommodations, we will know what they are, although they might be non-traditional. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, we know it'll be safety. There's a lot of factors we can control, but on these types of trips, there's a lot of factors that we can't control. And so early on, starting now, we really like to give people the seed that uh, flexibility and change will be a required and an integral part uh, of the entire expedition experience. And so you'll see off to the right here, there's a bunch of things that we cannot guarantee. Uh, and even if we could, uh, I, we almost don't even know them. And that is because it's dependent on so many factors, which include all the factors associated with a developing country. Uh, and fuel crises and a very vibrant and lively village dynamic that is different in every community because it's comprised of, of hundreds uh, or several hundreds of, of people and families and their response to our visit while they've been working with choice for a long time years in some cases it will create all sorts of awesome opportunities that will change and ebb and flow the work that we do and so all of these factors off to the right, in some instances can create challenges. In most instances, they create very fun opportunities to, again, have an experience that is very non-traditional 
to normal travel, which is it's an adventure. We're rolling with the punches that come by being way out in the mountain ranges, seven outside, hours outside of Kathmandu, working with a community that has never had the opportunity to meet you know, someone from uh, the United States ever. And so they're so excited and so are we. And so right now we just encourage everyone to start to think of an expedition in these types of terms as we will do our best, the leaders and myself, to make sure everything that we can know, everyone knows, even if it changes, that everyone's aware of the changes and aware of, of as much information as you can be at that time, and that everyone can be prepared for when the unknown factors happen to roll with the punches and be flexible so that uh, the trip moves along and everyone can have a safe, great time. So with that, we'll move on a little bit to the specifics around this trip and I'll hand it over to, uh, to your expedition leader, Veronica, Veronica, to kind of just walk through the generals, the, the general ebb and flow of kind of the first uh, component of arriving and kind of what it looks like from there. Great. Thank you, Jordan. So this will just give you a snapshot of the week. And as we get closer, of course, we'll drill down into more specifics, but this will help you uh, get a sense of what that um, expedition week will look like. So we will... Um, we will come together um, on that first day will be a, a Saturday and um, we will arrive in Kathmandu and uh, we'll, we'll meet you at the airport. We will get you transported over to our hotel. That evening we will meet together, do some introductions, get to know one another and just kind of set our, um, uh, our schedule for the week and let you know what, what will come. So we'll have dinner together and an orientation. And then the next day after breakfast, we will take a long, but um, an adventurous and beautiful ride um, up to a um, village in the Lamjung district. And um, it'll be a little bit like Mr. Toad's wild ride. I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it will be some of the most incredible views you've ever seen. I guarantee you that as we're at the, the foot of the Annapurna um, in that area. We'll unpack and settle in. And then for the duration of our, our week there together where we engage with the village, where they're guests, and um, every morning we will have breakfast together. We will um, get to work together with our new friends in the village on some um, projects together that they've determined are, um, are just, uh, it's the right time for them to be engaging in these projects for where they are in their development cycle. And uh, so we'll get to be part of that, which is a really wonderful way for us to have this intercultural exchange. Uh, we'll have lunch together each day, um, you know, and have some wonderful afternoon activities that could involve project work or uh, opportunities to play cricket together, to play soccer together, to um, learn how to harvest certain types of, um, of uh, grains. It just There's a myriad opportunities for intercultural exchange that are all really important. I will have some personal time in the evenings after dinner, group discussions. And then on the Friday of that week, uh, we will have um, our, our, the village farewell. Um, I neglected to mention we will be heartily and warmly greeted upon arrival in the village. I can guarantee you there will be fanfare and music and um, there will be a lot of dancing throughout the week. And so get prepared for that. It's a wonderful spectacle. And uh, we will be sent off with um, a celebration. And again, we'll have a nice long ride back to uh, Kathmandu, which will be a great opportunity to just share your experiences talk about some of the things you've learned and um, it can just be a really wonderful way to to kind of um, uh, put a punctuation mark on on the, the week you've had we'll have dinner together and a little debrief conversation and a farewell that night at the hotel and then Saturday after breakfast um, folks can have personal time depending on when their flights depart so just very high level that's how our week together will look as we travel from Kathmandu to Lamjung and back and let me add a quick note here, which is my mistake. The dates you'll see up there, everything's correct, minus the December and January date there. Uh, that is my mistake. So that's one of those bits of information that surely is not going to change on you. <laughs> um, so don't be alarmed by those of you looking at those and scratching your head. Um, and I can send an adjusted slide over after this that's kind of reflects the correct dates but otherwise everything in that agenda is specifically mentioned I will maybe pause for a minute to see if anyone has any questions no if not we'll 
we'll continue to move along uh, just a bit here as we talk about, okay, now where are we going? Um, and Veronica, I'll let you kind of take it and I can kind sure. of see as you go. Great, thank you. So you'll see, again, high level snapshot of Nepal and you'll see there, um, we've got a blue arrow pointing to where the airport is. So we'll all fly into Kathmandu and then you'll see the, um, the Lamjung district is indicated there in red. So that helps to give you an idea of how much of a distance we're traversing. And it may not look like it's very far and, and we have indeed indicated it'll be of seven to eight hours. That tells you that the roads are not flat, straight and paved. They are windy and bumpy and um, adventurous. And so although it doesn't look like a very uh, long distance, uh, it'll take us a good seven, eight hours to traverse it. But I guarantee you the, the views will be unforgettable for you. So hopefully that will help you just get a sense of place as you get ready to, to um, and prepare for this trip. And Bruna, can you just talk a little bit about what that looks like that first oh, day on, on the bus? I know there's some transfers sure. there and kind of how you know, absolutely stopping and kind of what that pace looks like. Sure. So we will typically depart Kathmandu out of the one main road that heads toward Lamjung and we'll typically be in a traditional tourist motor coach for that. So of just a kind of a big tourist bus like you might expect. But as the terrain changes and as is necessary for the particular destination within Lamjung, we will have uh, periods where we will we'll stop uh, use a restroom facility, grab a snack, and transfer onto smaller buses that can handle those roads better. Um, if we are going to a place where the, the roads are particularly adventurous, uh, we can end up in what I kind of call the mountain buses. The, the wheels are higher, the axle is mounted higher, and it will be um, a beautiful but bumpy ride. So I would just advise that everyone pack an anti-nausea medicine that works for them if you happen to get motion sickness. I think it's just the best way to guarantee that you will enjoy this beautiful ride without being uncomfortable. So be prepared for, for some bumps and, um, and you know, a little bit of adventure along the way as we traverse roads that go from uh, you know, dirt with a few potholes to some that are a little bit more carved out because of the, the uh, weather and how the, the rains come through that area. But um, yeah, it'd be an adventure, but absolutely beautiful and just, yeah, be, be prepared for that. Yeah, and I, I always encourage people to not, not be shy about bringing you know, your music or even anything to watch. The real goal is to make sure you know, you, you don't get sick and that you can kind of enjoy that ride. There's so much to see and enjoy, but feel comfortable to bring uh, whatever you might need uh, to make that trip, you know, enjoyable. And that could be anything from a Dramamine to, uh, you know, homeopathic ginger, even to like an um, on Densitron. So just uh, talk to your healthcare provider, see what might be best for you. And again, yeah, this, yeah, this is just kind of one more detailed map to show you all the region that we'll be navigating to. So uh, you've got access to that. Uh, and if you look into Google Maps, Lamjung will, will generally pull up this area here. And this is an area in which Choice has been operating uh, for quite some time. And you'll see a variety of landscapes as we go through. You'll see small <laughs> villages, um, rivers, suspension bridges, myriad uh, just really wonderful sites uh, that, that will be um, help you get a, a sense for the landscape of Nepal. Um, so speaking a little bit about uh, the project that we'll be able to engage with here, I'd love to give you a little bit of background. Um, you are probably familiar with um, the earthquake that struck Nepal in April of 2015. Um, to give you a little bit of context, this earthquake, depending upon the scale that's used, uh, measured between 7.8 to an 8.1. Um, it was devastating for the country. Um, just that initial quake uh, killed 9,000 people, injured um, more than, um, than 23,000, triggered um, landslides or avalanches at Everest, and just was a really, really um, traumatic event for the country. It was the worst natural disaster they'd had since the, um, there was a quake in 1934. And um, along with the, the very, very sad loss of life, um, there were a loss of um, not only historical structures, things that were really meaningful from a cultural perspective for the people of Nepal, they also lost more than 4,000 schools. Now, luckily, um, the schools that Choice had been involved with in this region, it, building uh, more than 40 schools, those withstood the quake. We're really pleased about that. So th that was really wonderful news. 
And um, so now you can see that there's, there's going to be a need to rebuild these schools and that's going to take a while. So um, there will be an opportunity in uh, this region to work on um, rebuilding a multi-room earthquake safe schoolhouse. And um, this is really important because we are going in with a model that will be used by other organizations uh, to have these be safe for this seismically active zone and um, will kind of set the standard for groups moving forward. So very excited about that and what that will mean for getting the children back to that sense of normalcy as they can be back in proper school rooms, resuming those activities that really help, um, you know, help them feel resettled after such a traumatic event. So that'll be really exciting for us to get to work together with um, our new friends in the village on, on a project like this. And one thing I'll add here that is a question that sometimes comes up about our work in Nepal. So as I mentioned, choice, you know, is typically focused on, on extreme poverty development projects, which can be anything from building out health infrastructure to an educational infrastructure. But when the earthquake happened, uh, priorities shifted heavily for our in-country team. And we, uh, just at Choice generally, were overwhelmed with just amazing support from organizations and companies and individuals here in Utah and all over the country who were able to donate so much resources to the rebuilding efforts going on in Nepal. And so a lot of project work uh, for the in-country teams has really shifted towards immediate kind of crisis stabilization. So temporary housing, temporary uh, venues for schools. And a lot of our projects now uh, have shifted a little bit from our normal development trajectory uh, to focus on this type of reconstruction. And so there's a real interesting blend of kind of crisis rehabilitation and earthquake rehabilitation and the traditional choice model of long-term development. And the team has just navigated that very well in country. And actually Vishnu and the in-country team uh, were viewed as a major resource for the, the national government in terms of reconstruction and mapping that out. And they've done so with a lot of efficacy. So it's really neat that the expedition in this instance will go down. We'll kind of get a support that effort as well as kind of understand the, the normal development process within which that's taking place. So um, pretty powerful what they've been able to do. All right, I'll hand it off to you, Veronica. Great, thank you. So just to give you a little bit uh, a sense of what the, our time together will look like once we arrive there in the Lamjung area. Um, we will make sure that you eat well. Uh, we will have food prepared for you. We'll have three square meals a day. Uh, it will all be safely prepared and it will be a mix of Nepali uh, food, Pan-Asian food and some typically Western affair as well. So you'll eat well and um, uh, everything that we will serve you will be safe to eat. We'll make sure you have plenty of uh, purified water to drink. And so we'll, we'll make sure that, that you have a happy belly and that you have the energy you need to really enjoy your day. Um, we will be set up um, in, uh, it's basically going to be camping, but inside. So you'll see there uh, the food being served in a tent-like structure. That's quite common uh, in this area. And um, we typically, as the guests there, will be given a few rooms in the schoolhouses or a community building where we will roll out our sleeping bags and set up kind of a cozy little um, space for ourselves with our bags, our, um, our sleeping bag, our personal items. And um, those will be your, your close quarters. So it's a group sleeping environment, but there'll be some tents set up for things like taking a bucket shower, changing clothing, and um, there'll be some of the typically um, Nepali style squat latrines as you'll see a picture of there that are kept quite tidy that um, those are typically the school bathrooms we use so be prepared for something that is very much like a camping trip you would take um, with your good friends who you're about to get to know really well uh, there could be some snoring um, other types of things we take that in stride with humor maybe bring some earplugs but um, you're gonna get to know your fellow expeditioners really well as we share this time together in these close, um, cozy quarters. So that's a little bit what the eating and living um, arrangements look like there. And a, really, a few thoughts I might just add to that. So on the eating yeah. side, uh, we'll eat really well, but feel comfortable to bring snacks yes. or 
candies or little little comfort items that you might want granola bars oh sherry will bring her out. And, and grandma might come <laughs> <laughs> uh staff with stocked with a lot of stuff but feel comfortable to bring some snacks in that nature however there will be some great meals also some great mm -hmm. snacks along the way but it's always good for those bus trips etc to just have a few go-to items if something's not feeling well if your appetite's off uh, and, and I definitely recommend that. And then we will talk just a minute about packing, but since we're on the topic of kind of camp living generally, there are some very basic mats that the in-country team has, uh, and most people comment that those are comfortable and that those work. Uh, when in doubt, feel comfortable to bring your own kind of camping mat, which could be a small roll-up air mattress or a little bit bigger kind of battery-powered air mattress if you want to, along with your, your normal sleeping bag. And you'll want a sleeping bag that can accommodate some cooler temperatures at night and kind of dressing in layers and, and feel comfortable to bring a camping pillow or a normal pillow. Yeah. I can't guarantee there will be a place for a hammock, but I, I like it. I Guatemala, <laughs> we might be able to accommodate. <laughs> Uh, and, I, and I'd add to that, if I could, for sleeping bags, I generally myself will pack a sleeping bag liner just in case. We will be there in the springtime and depending upon the, the altitudes, it can get a little cool and I would much rather you have an extra layer with you that you maybe end up not needing than, than you be uh, too cool when you're sleeping at night. So just as you're gathering your supplies and thinking ahead, it's good to, you know, if you don't have one, maybe borrow one that you could pack with your sleeping bag. I'm sorry, Brian, what, is, what type of liner do you have? Um, I have one. It's just from REI. It's um, I, I don't remember the the brand of it right now, but it's just a. It's not one of the silky ones. It's one that feels. Um, it's a synthetic, but it's just a liner that adds a few degrees of warmth to the bag, and so it's oh, it's that's so, yeah, that's so just really small. It folds up to about that big. So um, I'm guessing in Utah, a lot of with where a lot of you you know you guys go camping because you have those beautiful mountains there. I'm guessing a lot of folks probably have those tucked away with their camping stuff, and it's just a handy tool to have with you just in case. Great, and we'll we'll review some packing items yeah. uh, towards the end, but just want to hit a few items as we go, kind of in context. Yeah. So as we mentioned, we will have a project that we'll be engaged in um, hip to hip with our friends from the village. So we'll get to spend our days working together. Um, you'll be shown what to do, where to go, and we'll get to spend time having this great intercultural exchange while working together on these projects. So you'll bring some gloves, you'll bring clothes that can get uh, dirty, and we will we'll have a lot of fun while we work on these projects together. Um, we tend to have a pace that we like to adhere to when we, you know, generally as expeditioners, we come in and we, we want to like work and, and get um, you know, a certain amount of work done and work really quickly. And, and we just want to remind you that um, every bit as important as that work opportunities for interaction, conversation, and play with our friends in the village. So that might mean taking a break and playing a pickup game of cricket or joining the, the kids from the local village who want you to come and play soccer or to sing and dance with them. Um, please feel free to do that. That's absolutely as important, building those bridges with your global neighbors. So um, we'll talk a little bit later about some tools that might help you do that. Um, but working and playing together, uh, it's, it's a really wonderful um, opportunity that we'll have there as we're welcomed into, into the village. And maybe one, one item I'll add on the playing side here, uh, and the Stevensons who are in London, who will be joining us, I, they know this item well, is also come prepared with some games and cards and things to play amongst ourselves. There's a lot of downtime, uh, whether in route and traveling and at night after dinners, um, yeah. after conversations, which we'll talk about in a little bit. There's kind of just wind down time and there's great opportunities to play together. And it's very common on expeditions to gravitate towards a number of games uh, and play them quite competitively. So uh, things like Uno and just basic card decks yep. are really great tools to bring uh, to just play amongst ourselves when those opportunities present themselves. So something else for us to keep in mind as we're coming in, we will be learning a lot about 
um, about Nepal, about the history, the culture of the people, the project on which we're working. And we'll learn a lot from our hosts there in the village, and they will learn a lot from us. So as you kind of set your intention for the trip and think about what you might want to accomplish, just encourage you to think about that learning going both ways. There'll be opportunities to learn about one another's homes and jobs and families and foods and, you know, bring a photo album of your family, your pets, what the mountains look like where you live. And to just sit and learn together, learn some words of Nepali, um, sit with the kids and learn a song in Nepali. And just, I really encourage you to soak up those opportunities to learn. And then, um, Nepal, there's a lot of joy that you will experience from the moment we arrive and you are given your first tikka on your forehead and your first garland of flowers. Um, there will be music and dancing and singing throughout the week and wonderful, um, tearful celebration as we depart. So just be prepared to feel a lot of joy and to really just celebrate our time together, the things we're learning and the projects that we'll work on together. Um, it's, it's really unlike anywhere I've ever been. And, and I think you're just going to have a, just a wonderful time learning and celebrating with, um, with the people who will become your new friends in this region. Uh, and one thing I will add on that, just to go back to that general breakdown of what a day looks like, uh, learning and celebrating and working all kind of start to mix in very organically to the day. But generally speaking, we'll start a day off and by eight o'clock have ate breakfast, gone over the plan for the day, and usually spend that morning till about lunch, working on the project as planned. Then we'll eat lunch, kind of reconvene, and it's usually that afternoon between one o'clock and five o'clock where we'll start to see a mix of going back to the project, but also exploring other opportunities that have presented themselves, like visiting a classroom, visiting a farm, playing a soccer game, uh, taking a tour of, you know, someone, a, a network of homes that are located farther away. And so you'll start to see that those will start to bleed into the afternoons of the day. And then on the learning side, uh, a couple times during the weeks, particularly when we're in the country, uh, your in-country leader, your in-country directors, along with the expedition leaders, will really try and create a couple evenings where there's a lot of discussion and Q&A. And so we make sure that as a group, people are processing a lot of things. They're seeing a lot of new things, things that they might understand, things that they might not understand. And, and so we make sure that leaders in the group have times in those evenings, maybe before card games and right after dinner, to really have some thoughtful conversations and learn and process together what they're experiencing and also get the opportunity for just some Q&A with our in-country directors and teams about uh, understanding maybe a lot more about the community that we might not see at face value. So that's a big learning component as well. Uh, and it's one of my favorite you know, things to do along with participants in every trip because it's just so different. And, I, and can I add, Jordan, we're really lucky as as English speakers, the Choice Nepal team by and large is bilingual. And so I encourage you, they're a really friendly, sincere group of people. Take the time to sit down and chat with them about their backgrounds, their how they got to work for Choice, and to ask them questions. We, we don't have a language barrier there like we might elsewhere. Um, and so I really encourage you to make those personal connections with them and let them help facilitate and you know that experience for you um, as, as those moments pop up. Don't be shy. Uh, it, it, it can lead to some really wonderful learning. And Veronica, do you want to just kind of walk through maybe this one as well? Sure, sure. So we've found as we have done uh, many expeditions that given the things that are known and the things that are unknown, there are a few components or things that each individual can keep in mind to um, ensure that he or she has a really run, wonderful, rich expedition experience. And so the first is flexibility. Um, and being basically, we'll, we'll say, just knowing that things can and will change as we're in these developing areas doing this type of work. So if we can go into things um, knowing, yes, we've got a plan for the day or for the trip, and we will communicate information just as soon as we have it. Um, we will, as leaders, that's our promise to you. 
but a commitment to just being flexible and being willing to kind of go with things and to let things that change become opportunities for growth, for learning, for, um, for exploration, and just uh, being willing to kind of let go of some of the rigidity we generally have in our day-to-day -day lives and to just allow yourself to be flexible, which kind of feeds in really well to this next, which is sense of humor. Um, we have found that if we as expeditioners can um, encounter changes, challenges, opportunities with a sense of humor, encounter your snoring um, uh, roommate with a sense of humor, or the cold bucket shower, or the bus breaking down uh, with a sense of humor, then it really helps to enrich the experience that instead of turning from something that's a, in, turn into something that could be frustrating, it just helps to add more color and richness to this experience. Um, so just being, you know, uh, being willing to, to step back and kind of have a laugh as we experience these things together. Um, and the third is mindfulness. And I'll talk about what, what this means on a couple of levels. Uh, of course, there will be the mindfulness uh, that we are guests in a country with which many of us may not be familiar. And wanting to be mindful about, um, you know, how we present ourselves as um, representatives of um, you know, the, the cities and states from which we come, we are there as representatives of Choice Humanitarian, and just being mindful about the way that we're interacting as guests in this Nepali community, and just taking a moment to observe uh, to customs and what's polite, and asking questions if we're not sure, and just being really mindful of our own interactions with our, um, you know, with our Nepali friends. Being mindful about our interactions one with another as um, family members, fellow expeditioners, uh, taking good care of one another. Um, you know, if you see somebody in the group who seems to not be feeling well, go ahead and, and ask them, you know, how are you doing? We as expedition leaders, of course, do our best to, to keep an eye on everybody, but it's, it's really nice if we can be mindful of one another as well. And, uh, and not be afraid to, to speak up then uh, yourself as you're mindful about yourself, uh, what your needs are. If you're not feeling well, if you um, you know, if something's not sitting well with you, you're, you're feeling kind of sick, be mindful about yourself and what you're bringing to the experience and what you're experiencing yourself and using us as resources to communicate that. So um, kind of keeping those three things in mind um, can help you have a really wonderful experience, even though there, I guarantee you there will be some things that come at us that uh, might be curveballs, but really are just opportunities for learning and growth and flexibility. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I just want to wrap up here to just introduce a couple key rules. These will be more relevant when you're there, but it's helpful now. We'll kind of talk about these a little bit because many, as they're preparing a few weeks out or two months out, starting to think, what can, I, what can I bring? What else can I do to kind of contribute to the community? And these types of things tend to touch on that. Uh, I'll talk about the, the bottom two first, and then I'll, I'll share a few thoughts on no gifts. So first off, generally speaking, uh, Choice is an apolitical, a religious, non-denominational organization uh, with wide support, both here in Utah and abroad. And particularly, our in-country teams have been invited through trust into every community in which they're working. So it's very critical that on every expedition, there's no ideological proselytizing within the group we want participants to feel so comfortable and we want the commonality to be the reasons for which we've come the shared culture that we have and the reasons and the experiences that we're having there and not particular sets of beliefs or perspectives that can be divisive or disruptive and we also want that to remain the same between our group and the community so it goes both ways uh, third no promises. We're going to experience uh, a range of challenging situations where individuals are going to be in a range of circumstances that can be very difficult to just generally witness. It can be hard and it can create a range of desires that we also have to give beyond this expedition or figure out how we can help. But because Choice has built a sustainable and trustworthy relationship with each community, it's really important that we don't interrupt that plan and that progress that they've already got in place. So part of that is no promising, no making any promise that we cannot complete while on that trip. And so if, if, if we get asked, uh, always deflect to the in-country directors and teams as their position to really navigate that. Uh, because we certainly don't want to make a promise that we don't complete and have that reflect on the team and the whole, the whole organization. 
And then the first one up there, which is really the most important and the easiest to break is no gifting. And what we mean by this is gifts, large or small, they could be a bouncy ball, it could be crayons, it could be anything, a bracelet. But what happens is if we're doing individual gift giving, it's infinitely always going to be impossible to make sure that every kid or every mother or every father has the chance to receive a gift. And when we cannot get a gift to everyone and give it to some, it does create tension and it does create frustration. Uh, but even more so than that, the, we're there to support work that this village is carrying out on their own. And we really want our relationship to be of supporting that project. We certainly don't want to leave the imprint in that community that when groups come or when development comes, they're, they're there to give. And we want the real gift to be interactions and memories and exchanges. And so because of that, we have a really strong policy of no individual gift giving. However, there's a couple things that we can do to, to yes, leave some resources in the community that they might not otherwise have. So school supplies, soccer balls, frisbees, uh, some basic resources can be collectively given to school committees, uh, school administrators, or community leaders. And in that fashion, they really distribute that for the best use. They're not given individually, but rather used by the community at their discretion. And so feel comfortable to bring supplies. Those always go a very long way uh, and are, are very helpful to you know, the communities that we go in. And the couple things that you can bring that, that create the right types of impressions and memories are things that facilitate interactions. Uh, so they could be having just in mind a handful of games to play. And those could be duck, duck, goose to, you know, uh, any other kind of school game that you might play. It could be uh, fingernail polish. It could be bubbles. It can be face paint. Those types of things that when you use it, it's gone, but what's left is a lot of fun memories and you don't have to be so concerned about whether or not every kid's getting one, but they can be used to play with a bunch of people. And they're very helpful to also just kind of facilitate what is that intercultural exchange. So those are our thoughts on gifts. And if you have any questions, always resource, you know, you use your leaders as a resource on that. Um, and we'll kind of take the last few minutes and we've mentioned some of these items before, but I'll let Veronica really go through and just kind of talk about a few of the items that, uh, you know, that are helpful to have. Everyone should have this packing list. So this is not meant to go through item by item, but rather as a reminder that you have it uh, and that use it. But we'll maybe pull out a few things to keep in mind that might be more relevant for this particular trip. Um. Thank you. So again, I won't go through all of these bullet points, but I can tell you what I have found works for me so that as you go through the list, maybe that will be helpful for you. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, with the uh, where, where we're headed, um, I think layers are the name of the game here. So as you're packing, uh, you'll want to have your work clothes allow for sunny days. Um, and so you'll, you'll want some, you know, as this indicates, some short sleeve work shirts, things like that. But um, be prepared to, to change into some layers in the evening, uh, something we often will tell people, um, you know, maybe you want to have just one set of clothes that that's what you, you get cleaned up, you change into that in the evenings. And so maybe you're wearing those same clothes every evening. That's totally fine. On an expedition, absolutely fine for you to be doing a lot of repeats. That's okay. So I'd say just make sure you've got layers with you, short sleeves, long sleeves, um, so you can layer up in the evening. In the event that there is some rain, really, really important that you have something waterproof with you just to keep you comfortable. Um, I tend to prefer like dry fit uh, pants during the day to a work in, that's just me, and then jeans at night. But again, whatever's comfortable for you, um, this packing list is here to serve as a guide for you. Um, we will typically use bucket showers there, so I find it helpful to have a microfiber towel. They're small, they dry quickly, and uh, work pretty well for that space um, so that you can kind of get tidied up when, uh, when you have your shower there. Um, you'll see a couple of notes on the right-hand side there. Uh, antibacterial hand gel, the team will typically provide a few pumps of that, but good to just have your own supply as we stop, you know, en route and use bathroom facilities and such. Um, You'll see, again, some things on the side there. I'd love to, to encourage you um, to talk with your healthcare provider about uh, what would be 
uh, a good medicine for you should you uh, develop traveler's diarrhea. I myself recommend a zithromycin or a Z pack. It's helpful for you to have something that you know your physician or um, or nurse has prescribed for you. So um, that's my recommendation there to get something that you can have with your name on it so that if you get sick, we know it's good, uh, a good thing to give to you. Um, let's see, Jordan, do you mind scrolling through to the next slide here? Um, let's see here. Uh, again, we've talked a little bit about um, the sleeping arrangements. So yeah, just make sure that you've got a sleeping bag, a liner if you'd like, that pad if you'd like. A headlamp is really important for Nepal. Um, so make sure you've got a headlamp that works for you, some extra batteries. I find having a beanie is good too for these villages. Um, those Ziploc bags are handy for putting uh, uh, your dirty clothes in if you want to keep those separate from your clean clothes that you want to wear toward the end of the trip. Um, and uh, you're going to see some of the most beautiful views that I think you've ever seen. So I just be thoughtful about um, making sure you're able to, to capture those. I, I tend to use just my iPhone now, but um, just uh, keep in mind, you know, what, if you're um, really into photography, what you might want to have with you to capture those because the, the vistas can just be absolutely breathtaking. And um, so encourage you to think about how you might want to record those memories for yourself. Um, we talked a little bit about group sleeping environments. So any sleep aids that might help you be comfortable there and um, the cultural sharing items, Jordan had mentioned a few of those, and I'll just reiterate, um, photo albums are a great, great thing, just a small pocket one. One of the most rewarding experiences I had was visiting with a mom and young son. I brought out my album, was showing family members. She instructed her little boy to run in the house, and he came out with their photo album. And it, he was so excited to show me pictures of his mom, who was a village leader. Um, so just, uh, just be thoughtful about what would be meaningful exchange for you. Um, Let's see, I think, oh, and then uh, as was mentioned, uh, great to bring those, those games to play one with another, uh, snacks that are comfort foods for you. Chocolate can be a little bit difficult to come by in Nepal, so if you're a big fan of M&Ms like I am, you might want to pack your own stash of those for yourself and to share with uh, um, the, the expedition group in the evenings if you'd like. And um, other than that, again, this is a pretty comprehensive list. Feel free to reach out to us with specific questions, but um, those are a few of the things that I find uh, to be helpful as we prepare and pack for this trip. Yeah, so does anyone with that have any questions uh, packing wise or? No. All right, we're feeling good. Well, good, so with that. Oh, wait, I think, you know, I, or oh, I think you're muted. Oh, hold on here. Hi, Debbie, did you have a question? Yeah, um, I was just wondering about charging. If you're going to use your iPhone for as a camera, yeah. will there be places to charge them? So typically, and Jordan, please feel free to, to jump in here if I'm wrong. Typically, there will be a few hours of, um, of electricity, just the way that the power grid is in Nepal, especially in these villages. If we're, when we're at a schoolhouse, there is typically a few hours of electricity um, during which we can do some charging. So we will just take turns doing that. Um, I found though, since I'm not using my phone for texting or making phone calls, that using it just as a phone, excuse me, as a camera, doesn't use a whole lot of the battery. So I found that I can get by with maybe one charge or so just as the electricity is available, but I wouldn't plan to be able to use electricity um, often, uh, to be frank. Um, but often in the evenings, we'll have a couple hours where we can plug in and do that. But you, you just want to touch on the adapter situation and where and if that's sure. necessary. So I can speak to if you're using an iPhone, um, the cool thing about the iPhone plug is that it does work there um, in, uh, in the, the outlets that are at the school. There's typically a surge protector that the Choice Nepal team plugs in. I myself have never had to use a plug or voltage adapter to charge at the schools. Uh, because the Choice Nepal team will have typically uh, that surge protector plugged in in the sleeping room and you plug into that and the, the Apple plug um, regulates. So I, I can't guarantee that because they don't work for Apple, but I would say, you know, check the specs on your phone, but I have never had to use a converter or um, adapter to charge my iPhone there in Nepal. Yeah, and it's it's 220 volt and so that's where most cell phone kind of adapters or chargers or yeah. even camera batteries can can regulate through that. Um, yeah. a, a couple of little items that might be helpful also are just those USB pre-chargers that you can mm -hmm. charge 
Uh, and you can load that up with maybe one or one and a half charges. Mm -hmm. They're very tiny. Uh, and you can have that um, as a resource when you're out there. Some individuals will also use solar charging small panels as well. But there will definitely be opportunities to charge as needed. So that shouldn't be too, uh, too necessary. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions from you guys or? Um, let's see. I think we, there are no additional vaccinations besides just being up to date. That's correct. Right. Um, so no, I got a weird pop in there. Oh, it can yellow people. So yep. there's no yellow fever then. So yellow fever so can go in, right? Yeah, yellow fever is not required for Nepal. Um, and, and so it may be recommended from an international, depending on your international see it was. traveling nurse recommended, but it, it's not required. What about the typhoid? Typhoid is a good shot to have regardless. That would almost fall into kind of your, your, again, it's not required to get into the country, but that typhoid, tetanus, diphtheria which are usually done as a quick booster shot, a uh, kind of uh, packaged, that would be in our list of, of, of okay. a recommended basic immunization okay. to have. I always, I always keep my typhoid current since I go to Nepal every year. And they have a, yeah, so I always do typhoid. I've done yellow fever. I figure if, especially if your insurance covers it, um, it's just good to get it done, especially since we have time. I yeah. don't have it. I have my pediatrician. Uh, it's either go to the Utah Valley Health Center or Salt Lake Valley Health Center or down to Utah Valley where you can get it for free. It's a couple hundred bucks in Salt Lake. And okay. so Debbie called me about that. Yeah. Or and those I'll are, send you the info. and both, you know, those are, yeah, yellow fever, et cetera. So, those are all, all shops that if, you know, we've got a, a lot of younger folks going, yeah. they anticipate over the next handful of years of generally doing broader international travel mm -hmm. in certain instances will be required. Uh, while they're not required for entry, et cetera, in Nepal, um, yeah. they, they should be a good base to have. And I think the exhibition manual kind of specifies some of those is, is have a good look with your provider. And malaria, because I didn't, my, Tiffany was supposed to send me the shots that she was getting Hayden and my mom didn't know. So, and then malaria. Malaria, not a primary issue in this area. Nope. Perfect. So no the one thing, one thing I would recommend, you're going to, we're all going to be taking really long flights and most, a lot of us will pick up a cold on en route. I always do when I go to Nepal. So one thing I've found, I always bring a big box of Advil cold and sinus. And um, so if you tolerate ibuprofen well, just Mike, what I have found is that is the best thing because a couple of days in, as you're tired, you're adjusting to the jet lag and the cold is catching up to you. Um, you're a lot more comfortable and a lot happier if you've got a cold medicine that you know works for you and plenty of it. So again, something that might seem kind of simple, but tough to get once we're up in the village. So just something else you might want to pack. Yeah. And on the preventative side, uh, just another thing I, I know I, there's a lot of recommendations here, but another thing that's very easy to do, uh, a week before the trip and kind of carried throughout is all usually bring, uh, kind of an emergency supplement packets get them for like ten dollars there'll be 50 or more in there yeah and uh and i swear by that i have been traveling quite i just got back from a round of expeditions and uh this is the first time that i've done that like very diligently and i i really bypassed getting sick in most instances so what who knows what that's attributed to there was i certainly am a fan of of using every tool at your disposal because you really don't want to get sick and and that'll help you just kind of hit the ground running with energy and that's just a nice uh, supplement to have while you're there yep. um a couple last question maybe that comes up sometimes that hasn't come up here on the packing side is what kind of bag do i bring mm -hmm. um and there's generally two types that i would recommend one is your typical backpackers backpack uh, with no metal frame, but the type that you might take on a longer backpacking trip or, you know, a longer road trip, um, which those can be great. You, they've got straps that you can throw on. You're not going to need 
carry equipment too long. If you do, uh, in terms of some community access, there's, there's generally a lot of help for that. But it, those just are much more durable. They're getting moved around a lot and they just last well. There's nothing to break. Another type of bag, and this is what I use, is kind of a waterproof duffel bag. It's, it's a little bit wider, which allows you to use a lot of kind of compartment packing Ziplocs or bags, get in and out of it really easy, and you can kind of just throw that thing anywhere. Uh, North Face makes a really good one that's really durable and has backpack straps if you don't have one already, or uh, any kind of just big compartment bag. I just, you can bring them, it's fine, but I do discourage wheeled luggage just because it's a lot more likely to get damaged. It'll work, it's totally fine, but you're gonna be throwing it around a lot and wheels get broken and it's going in and out of buses. So, uh, Are you going on the trip? I'm not going on the trip. I, I wish I was going on this trip, uh, but I'm not. I'm gonna be with you guys in spirit. I am heading the week, right, at, right when this trip ends, uh, I'll be overlapping a little bit with an expedition to Bolivia. So I'll be there on the opposite side of the world, uh, <laughs> camping out right with you guys. So I think we've covered a lot of stuff, a lot of great questions. I do just want to highlight that everyone should have a number of materials with them. And we've also got a lot of time. Uh, one of the reasons why we're doing this orientation a little bit sooner is because Veronica, I think I'd mentioned, she's going to be leading for quite some time a number of expeditions for us. Uh, most of those are in Nepal. One of those starts up this weekend in Guatemala. So she is heading off to Guatemala, and then we'll be heading right back to Nepal to make another trip at the beginning of Nepal, uh, the beginning of March. And so Veronica will be on and offline, and I wanted for sure all of us to have the chance to kind of meet her. Um, Keith who is the other expedition leader, along with myself, will be at your disposal for questions uh, and reaching out. And I think in the coming weeks, kind of that first week in March, Keith will probably reach out to each one of you uh, just personally through a phone call to connect, see if you guys have any additional questions. Uh, you've got all of our information. And so I, I think the group is shaping up to be uh, just a, a really fun trip. And I think everyone's in great hands. So with that, uh, we will see you all in Nepal uh, or, or after. I, I, at least I'll have to catch you after. But thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Okay, take care. Good night. Thanks. Good night. All right. So we will. I want to go.